Come to Hawaii. The sun shines bright, the beaches are inviting, and a pineapple field stretches as far as the eye can see. There's plenty to do and plenty to see. Everyone's happy, and you're welcome upon arrival. Who knows? Maybe you'll find an opportunity and stay. Or at least say, I've seen it. Yes, life in Hawaii is good. It's paradise on earth. <laughs> That's what the marketing tells you, anyway. Because you're selling an image, and boy does it sell. Yep, you'd think this place was the Garden of Eden. The way to lose any earthly kingdom is to be inflexible, intolerant, and prejudicial. Another way is to be too flexible, tolerant of too many wrongs, and without judgment at all. It is a razor's edge. It is the width of a blade of peely grass. Queen Liliuokalani to her Hanai daughter, January 1917. In the Central Pacific, on a chain of islands known as Hawaii, in the high plains of an island called Oahu, sits one of the last remnants of the pineapple industry in the islands. This industry and people were key to the shaping of this archipelago. Culture, politics, economics, and notoriety changed and grew on the back of this product. A product so expensive before Hawaiian cultivation, few knew or used it. This is the story of pineapple and how it shaped Hawaii. Hawaii is a derivative of the Hawaiian word O-Y-He, meaning homeland. These islands and their people suffered greatly since the arrival of Captain James Cook in 1778. In 1795, Kamehameha I conquered and united the Hawaiian Islands. He may have thought that by uniting the islands, he could protect his people from outside influences. Regardless of his reasons, his kingdom, these islands in the middle of the Pacific, would be conquered in less than a century. Later and subsequent leaders would promote changes for better or worse that have shaped Hawaii into what we know today. One of the systems that helped the pineapple industry grow had its first seeds planted in another industry. Sugar. Sugar introduced the plantation system, and that system changed Hawaii forever. Sugar was not new to the islands. Hawaiians had cultivated the plant long before Europeans arrived. But once these recent immigrants started to grow it as a cash crop, it became extremely successful. The first successful sugar cane plantation was started in 1835 by Ladd and Company at Koloa, Kauai. As this crop grew more successful and influential, a gradual shift in politics began to take hold. Foreigners started demanding, persuading, and finally purchasing large amounts of property. This was not the Hawaiian way. Hawaiians were more communal when it came to land ownership. This change, however, started to alter the political landscape as foreigners began coming in in increasing numbers. And as they occupied more land, they wanted more say over the laws that governed the islands. And as these sugar barons' investments grew, stakes rose, and the prospects of letting those in power control them became untenable. So much so that in 1887, these men, acting under the name the Honolulu Rifle Company Militia, forced the then reigning king, Kalakaua, to sign over most of his rights under the so-called Bayonet Constitution, a constitution which gave more authority and rights to these new planters who had a stronghold over the growing economy. Under this new structure, not only was the monarchy suppressed, but also the voice of the native Hawaiians, who had seen little to no benefit from the changes in progress. Three years later, in 1890, the United States signed the McKinley Tariff into law, a law that sharply raised tariffs 
and effectively ended a period of Hawaiian dominance over the sugar industry in North America. The fall of sugar pushed Hawaii into economic turmoil. The planters who had enjoyed years of favorable laws in the U.S. were now subject to higher costs and more competition from other foreign producers. Dependence on sugar and the individuals who ran the industry were surely weighing on Queen Liliokalani's mind when she proposed a new constitution in 1893 to replace the 1887 version signed under duress by her brother. Her new version, if ratified, would revoke many of the powers accumulated by this plantation class and put the queen squarely back in control of the kingdom. The queen would again be responsible for the appointment of governors to each island for four years. American and European residents who were granted suffrage in 1887 would lose the right to vote. And Article 78 of the 1887 Constitution, which required the monarch to perform with the advice and consent of the cabinet, was left out. These proposals were met with huge support by the populace, a majority of which were still of Native Hawaiian heritage. However, the Americans and foreign nationals, who were around 46% of the total population, were in strong opposition. Hoping for American intervention, the plantation class began planning a coup. On January 16, 1893, a letter was signed and sent to John L. Stevens, the U.S. Minister to Hawaii, stating, Sir, we, the undersigned citizens and residents of Honolulu, respectfully represent that in view of recent public events in this kingdom, culminating in the revolutionary acts of Queen Liliuokalani on Saturday last, the public safety is menaced and lives and property are in peril. And we appeal to you and the United States forces at your command for assistance. The Queen, with the aid of armed force and accompanied by threats of violence, and bloodshed from those with whom she was acting, attempted to proclaim a new constitution, and while prevented for the time from accomplishing her object, declared publicly that she would only defer her action. This conduct and action was upon occasion and under circumstances which we created general alarm and terror. We are unable to protect ourselves without aid, and therefore pray for the protection of the United States forces. Signed, Citizens Committee of Safety. The crimes I am charged with all. The three intolerable measures with which my government stands charged by those who succeeded in enlisting the aid of so powerful an ally as the United States in this revolution are as follows. First, that I propose to promulgate a new constitution. I have already shown that two thirds of my people declared their dissatisfaction with the old one, as well they might, for it was a document originally designed for a republic, hastily altered when the conspirators found that they had not the courage to assassinate the king. It is alleged that my proposed constitution was to make such changes as to give the sovereign more power and to the cabinet or legislature less, and that only subjects, in distinction from temporary residents, could exercise suffrage. In other words, that I was to restore some of the ancient rights of my people. I had listened to whatever had been advised, had examined whatever drafts of constitutions others had brought me, and promised but little. But supposing I had thought it wise to limit the exercise of suffrage to those who owed allegiance to no other country, is that different from the usage in all other civilized nations on earth? Is there another country where a man would be allowed to vote, to seek for office, to hold the most responsible of positions without becoming naturalized and reserving to himself 
the privilege of protection under the guns of a foreign man of war at any moment when he should quarrel with the government under which he lived? Yet this is exactly what the quasi-Americans, who call themselves Hawaiians now and Americans when it suits them, claim the right to do at Honolulu. Hawaii's Story by Hawaii's Queen, Queen Liliuo Kalani. Having declared their fears, they took action the following day, January 17, 1893. Queen Lilili Okalani had seen in her lifetime the erosion of power held by the Ali'i, the royal class of Hawaii, along with the diminished power of her people, brought forth an ultimate conclusion when her power to rule was completely stripped and given to the insurgent sugar plantation owners. Owners who were descendants of mostly missionary families which had come to Hawaii to aid and enlighten a so-called heathen and ignorant local populace, within her own lifetime, most of the changes that led to this day had occurred. In around half a century, maybe two or three generations removed from her birth, the Hawaiians had lost control of their land. The Citizens Committee of Safety effectively took control of a government building in order to bolster claims of control, at which time U.S. Minister Stevens acted upon the letter he had received and indeed ordered the landing of 162 sailors and marines from aboard the USS Boston. Their march from landing on Hawaiian soil to positions was rather quick as the Boston was docked in Honolulu Harbor, only a few blocks from central Honolulu and the palace. Around 5 p.m., they took positions at the U.S. Embassy, the Consulate Office, and Arian Hall. All of these buildings were within minutes of the palace and made Queen Liliokalani readily aware of the formidable threat to her kingdom and rule. The Queen, and her loyal representatives made attempts to receive support from foreign emissaries. However, every government with a diplomatic presence in Hawaii, except for the United Kingdom, recognized the insurgents as the rightful leaders within 48 hours of the overthrow. Queen Lily Okalani, having had warm relations with Great Britain and Queen Victoria in particular, expected British support against this attack on her sovereignty. She had met and attended Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee in England and was received warmly along with other Hawaiian dignitaries during her stay. To her surprise and disbelief, Great Britain offered zero support for the Queen's cause. This essentially put a final chapter on the rule of Hawaii by the ancestors of those who first inhabited these islands between 700 and 1500 years prior. From that point to the present, Hawaii would continue to rapidly change. These changes in politics, culture, and economics were a far cry from what Hawaiians of only a few generations earlier would have imagined. And the plantation system and pineapple industry would be vital in the shaping of Hawaii's future. On the day of the overthrow, a foundation was laid for the impact the pineapple industry would make on this land. Although he would not become the official leader of the Republic of Hawaii until July 4 of the following year, Sanford Ballard Dole had been a leader in circles that had pushed for power. One of Governor Dole's contemporaries also helped influence the trajectory of the pineapple industry. This pioneer probably played the most important role in the industry's development as he laid the groundwork. His name was John Kidwell. John was born in the southeast of England in a town called Marwood on January 7, 1849. Around the age of 30, he had managed to find his way to San Francisco. Once there, he started a career in horticulture. 
Since the age of 15, he had worked with plants, and that familiarity led to quick work. Soon he was hired on at a well-established nursery run by John Sivers and started to meet many customers from Hawaii. Through these connections, he was informed of the need for a good nursery in the islands, and after gaining letters of introduction, he found his way to Honolulu. Once there, he established his first nursery in 1882. By the time of his arrival, the Hawaiian Islands, that had previously been dominated by native Hawaiian subsistence-driven agriculture, were well into a period of commercial agriculture that was being driven by sugarcane production. Kidwell knew of a demand for pineapple in San Francisco and the poor quality of shipments received from the islands. Up to that point, pineapples were not a truly commercial business as they were primarily picked wild on the big island of Hawaii and then transported to Honolulu, a process which could take a week or more from harvest to transport. In Honolulu, the shipment would be placed on commercial liners to San Francisco, with an average sailing time of 20 days between the port of Honolulu and San Francisco and the overall poor quality of the fruit. What eventually arrived to the west coast of the United States was less than desirable. Kidwell, along with a commercial shipper of fruit named Charles Henson, decided to attempt to cut time of transport and improve the quality by growing pineapple in the Manoa Valley of Oahu in 1885. They used wild cuttings from the Big Island of Hawaii and were successful in cultivating a crop. Unfortunately, the quality of the produce remained the same. Later that year, Kidwell decided to send off for another variety of pineapple called the Smooth Cayenne and after testing it by growing a dozen plants, he felt it would be a more successful variety and ordered an additional thousand from Jamaica. Out of these plants, 600 grew very well. Still, he was not satisfied, so he sent off to get 31 more varieties to test. After this extended testing, he decided his first choice was the best and scaled up his planting of the smooth cayenne variety. He is credited as being one of the first to use stumps of his plantings on a large scale to grow new plants, an idea still in use today. Unfortunately, his first partner, Charles Henson, died soon after their partnership began and he had to carry on alone. This was not to his favor as Kidwell's expertise was more in the growing of product, not the marketing of it. From 1886 to 1899, Kidwell did fairly well, but never great. He sold a majority of his crop locally, with a surplus going to California, although shipping time still presented many problems. Enter the canning industry, which had been around since 1816, but used primarily for meat preservation. Even once pineapples were being offered in cans, the quality was still substandard because they were picked green and the core remained. Kidwell had teamed up with a popular hardware salesman, John Emmeluth, in an effort to find a way of canning a quality pineapple. After three years of research and development, they landed on a good canning process. Unfortunately, by this time, the U.S. had a tariff in place on goods from Hawaii, which made it highly unprofitable for them to sell their product. Soon, even selling the fresh fruit abroad grew difficult, so Kidwell contracted with a wholesaler to deliver his product. This also eventually turned out to be as disastrous as his previous calculations. His wholesaler, Peter Camarinos, who in time would play a more prominent role in the pineapple industry, sued him for breach of contract. His claim? Kidwell had sold him poisonous pineapples that were unsellable. This may have been true, but it was probably not Kidwell's intentions. Kidwell, who had worked hard to cultivate this specific fruit in Hawaii, knew that if you left the crowns or top of the fruit intact, 
a person could use this to cultivate their own crops. Kidwell, wanting to protect his investment and not trusting his intentions, removed the crowns. The side effect of this was premature decay of the fruit. In a court battle that lasted four years, Camarinos finally came out the victor. And during that time, Camarinos had indeed established partnerships in order to grow his own crop. The pineapple plantation he led was named the Pearl City Fruit Company, and by 1892, he and Kidwell were the largest producers of pineapple. During the early 1890s, politics loomed large, which were one of the major factors in the development of Hawaii's pineapple industry. Kidwell was deeply involved in this political environment, primarily through his association with business partners who were heavily invested in the Reform Party. This is the party that had forced the city monarch, King Kalakaua, in 1887 to sign a new constitution which favored the wealthy white sugar plantation owners and disenfranchised the native Hawaiians to a greater extent. On the other side, Kidwell's rival, Camarinos, was also embedded in the political game. He was a royalist and in full support of policies that bolster the monarchy. In 1891, at the beginning of Queen Liliuokalani's rule, her focus was on diversifying the Hawaiian economy. There are two things that motivated her. The McKinley Tariff, or Tariff Act of 1890, which was framed by then representative from Ohio, William McKinley, a Republican and future president of the United States, led the passage of this act and it had disastrous effects on the Hawaiian economy, which at that point was highly dependent on the sugar industry. The import rates on sugar exports rose by 35%, which resulted in the Hawaiian market being undersold and an economic depression. The sugar growers, who were mostly white Americans, knew that if Hawaii were to be annexed by the United States, the tariff problem would naturally disappear and in turn solve their problems. Queen Liliuokalani understood the end goal for the reformists, which was another reason she desired a more diversified economy to rid her kingdom of any threat, internal or otherwise, that could further devastate her land and its people. May 30th, 1892, at the opening of the biennial legislature, Queen Lili Okalani announced, the appointment of a special commission is needed with a view to enable the small landholders to add to the wealth and progress of the kingdom by raising such products as the soil and climate of the country will support. The commission recommended the establishment of a Bureau of Agriculture and Forestry, which was the first agency of this nature in Hawaii. It would promote a diversification of what was grown and encouraged small farms over the plantations. Before the commission had issued a report, Queen Liliuokalani decided to use her own lands to support the objective. And with those lands comprising about a quarter of all lands in Hawaii, the potential to cause a great shift in economy and ultimately the political environment was real. Camarinos, by this time, had grown into a powerful player in the pineapple industry and was in favor of the Queen's actions and the tax breaks that would favor these budding agriculture endeavors. Surprisingly, some sugar planters were also in favor of a diversification plan because of losses that had been inflicted on their industry. But the rest of Queen Liliuokalani's proposals fell on deaf ears as they feared her reforms and ultimately wanted her gone. Thus, the overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani's rule was inevitable, and on January 17th of the following year, she was essentially out. When this happened, Peter Camarinos, along with a group of the Queen's strongest supporters, 
began to devise a plan on how to reinstate her as monarch. This group included a great deal of the Greek community, to which Camerinos was a member. Camerinos became a key member in a plot to take back the governance of the islands in 1895. A campaign which was quickly crushed, Governor Dole declared martial law, and the Queen, along with 190 individuals, were arrested. This included Camerinos, who after serving a jail sentence, was exiled. With his property confiscated, he left for California and never returned. Unfortunately, he never recovered from his involvement and support for the Queen, and died on December 8, 1897, in a California asylum for the insane under mysterious circumstances. Kidwell, however, also did not benefit from the demise of his strongest rival or the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. In 1892, Kidwell led the formation of the Hawaiian Fruit and Packing Company Limited. There he served as president, Lauren A. Thurston as vice president, and John Emmeluth as secretary. Both Thurston and Emmeluth were members of the Committee of Public Safety, the group directly responsible for the Queen's overthrow. Their corporation acquired more land for planting and made the first cannery for the industry. To run their cannery, they hired an expert from Baltimore, the epicenter of the cannery industry in America. Baltimore had canned pineapples since 1865 from the Caribbean, but unfortunately, the expert Kidwell and company hired knew little more than the locals. Frustrated, Kidwell took over development of the cannery business. Through his efforts, strict quality control, and guidelines, the process was improved. During this period, Governor Dole also supported the industry by continued endorsement of a law enacted under the Queen, which encouraged the cultivation, canning, and preserving of pineapples in order to diversify the economy away from sugar. For 10 years beyond 1892, all tools, machinery, appliances, buildings, and all other personal property used in the cultivation, canning, or preserving of pineapples were exempted from all taxes. Furthermore, anything imported for use in the process of delivering crop to market was also duty free. Despite all these advantages, duties on pineapple exports to America proved too much for Kidwell and he never saw much of a profit off his crops. He retired in 1898 and moved to a street near his original farm in Manoa. Unfortunately for Kidwell, his past failures prevented him from moving forward. Had he lasted a couple years more, he probably would have become the most powerful grower in the history of pineapple. In the same year of his retirement, 1898, the Republic of Hawaii saw their dreams come true when the islands were annexed by the United States. Upon annexation, all exports to the U.S. became duty-free and allowed Hawaii growers to be on equal ground with growers on the mainland. In the following year of 1899, as the century turned, the most influential individual in the Hawaiian pineapple story arrived. James Dole was born September 27, 1877 in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts to a Puritan American family. With strong beliefs in Christianity and following the scriptures, Puritans hope that by setting a good example, others will see and change their sinful ways. If you look at the oligarchy or big five companies that shaped Hawaii of today, a majority of those roots tie directly back to the original missionaries from New England. Their influence spread initially from religion, quickly into the cultural fabric, the economy, and finally,
politics. James Dole, once dubbed the Pineapple King, was a hardworking and innovative man, but his rise to the top would not have been possible if not for his connection to political and financial insiders of the time. In particular, Governor Stanford Dole, who was a very close first cousin to his father. So close, in fact, James's father, Charles Fletcher Dole, lived with the governor when he moved to Hawaii in 1909. Stanford Dole was born in Hawaii and was the son of American Protestant missionaries who moved to the islands from Maine. They were tasked with the running of Punahou School. Stanford left the islands but eventually returned and rose to prominence in politics and law. His leadership in the coalition that overthrew the Queen led him to becoming the President of the Republic of Hawaii and its first governor upon annexation by the United States. When his young cousin, James Dole, arrived in 1899, their connection was more like uncle to his nephew. Governor Dole was in the midst of a crisis in the form of the bubonic plague that was devastating the island and led him to shelter young James during the beginning of his arrival. Once the plague scare subsided, Governor Dole assisted his cousin in gaining the proper connections to pursue his Hawaiian dreams. This led to James being able to obtain land in the upper Oahu Valley of Wahiawa. The land was derived from government land. The idea was to diversify agriculture on the islands, but purchases were only open to a select group of individuals. Byron O. Clark, the secretary and commissioner of the Hawaii Bureau of Agriculture, secured a good portion of this land for himself and immigrants from California. He had immigrated from California not long before being appointed Commissioner of Agriculture. The Wahiawa Track, as it was often called, offered up land to 16 homesteader families on lots in size from 50 to 250 acres after the grazing leases for the land ran out. Two of the homesteaders occupying three of the biggest allotments were none other than Clark's wife and child. Californians got a bulk of the other, minus two lots, one of which was saved for Dole. Dole's lot cost him around $4,000, which is equivalent to about $121,000 today. Over time, Dole's direct ties to Hawaii's inner circle would prove to be more beneficial to his fortunes than even Commissioner Clark's were for the securement of his land. Soon, a consortium of these farmers developed and the crop of focus was pineapple. The initial slips used to start their endeavors were primarily taken from the abandoned Eva farm of Kidwell, first used by Clark to start another farm located in Pearl City they made their way up to the Wahiawa Track. This collective formed the Hawaiian Pineapple Company in 1901 with Dole as the leader. Within two years from their start, James Dole had convinced local and mainland businessmen to invest in the venture. One of these investors was J. H. Hunt of Hunt Foods of San Francisco. With an infusion of new capital, Dole constructed a cannery on land next to his fields. Initially, his cannery operated with hand-operated machinery and only canned around 1,900 cases. His knowledge of the process and improvements of his production line in time allowed his cannery to quickly multiply its output. By 1904, production increased to 9,000 cases, followed by another gigantic leap to 25,000 the following year. During this period, transporting the product from Wahiawa to the docks was an arduous journey. A journey that could take up to a week and involved a horse-drawn wagon 
trudging across rough, unpaved, and often muddy roads. Dole realized the inefficiency and lost this hat on the collective and sought out assistance to get his product to market. Walter F. Dillingham was born in 1875 to Benjamin Franklin D. Dillingham, a Massachusetts-born seaman who came to the islands in 1865 and had amassed an impressive number of businesses, one of which was the Oahu Railway and Land Company. Dillingham took control of his father's businesses due to failing health. Dole became acquainted with Walter in Boston when they both attended Harvard. Because of this familiarity, Dillingham had always been a strong supporter of Dole's efforts. When Dole needed land, he leased him 300 acres. Dole eventually convinced his classmate Dillingham to expand his railway from Waipahu to Wahewa, and in 1906, an 11 mile extension was constructed through the Waikakalua Gulch. Dole now had a more reliable way to bring goods to market, and Dillingham gained more control over the transportation infrastructure and had a toehold into the pineapple industry. In 1907, Dillingham also gained a direct connection to the top circles of Hawaii's political structure through his brother-in-law. Dillingham's sister, Mary Emma, was married to Walter F. Freer, who served as governor from 1907 till 1913. During this period, Dillingham's businesses and influences grew in direct relation to the islands. Dole also benefited during this period. Dillingham's investment gave his plantation a direct connection to a cannery he built in Ivole near the port, along with two warehouses and an office building. Soon after Dole's production rose to 168,000 cases and his climb from simple farmer to a true giant of industry was complete. 1907 was a remarkable year for Dole, but a panic in the markets within the United States threatened the growth of all industries in the islands. This caused Dole and his counterparts to start thinking of ways to curve any potential loss by improving how their product was marketed. On May 7, 1908, nine of the pineapple canners founded the Hawaiian Pineapple Growers Association, or HPGA, with Dole becoming its first president. Through this formation, Canners could place national advertising that promoted Hawaii's product as a unified brand, a brand which outclassed all others because of where it was grown. Dole and the other Hawaiian canners decided that an expenditure of $50,000, or about 3% of the existing value of their products, would be a good starting point to launch their campaign. One canner, Will B. Thompson, justified the use of advertising by stating, The Packers will have to do a lot of missionary work among the consumers first. Of the 80 million people in the United States, probably half of them have never tasted pineapples and a majority of the balance have looked upon them as luxury. Ad campaigns from this point forward promoted the various ways and benefits of pineapple, Hawaiian pineapple. As a side promotion of the product, Hawaii itself got showcased. Hawaii, an idealist paradise of luxury and pleasure that everyone should visit. Their promotions were a success, but the growth scene was not only due to their strategic moves. More important than that were the people who dealt directly with their product in the fields, on the cannery floors, and the loading docks. These individuals were the backbone of the industry, literally. In 1853, indigenous Hawaiians made up 97% of the island's population and were the first cultivators of pineapple in Hawaii. Hawaiians as a group, by 1923, had been reduced to only 16% of the population. This decline in numbers 
can be attributed to many factors, including cultural ignorance, political interference, and most importantly, interactions with diseases from which they had no immunity. All these hardships led Hawaiians to be less inclined to work on plantations. Plantation owners, in an effort to fill their labor needs, turned to outside sources to meet workforce demands. In a sense, this is a mirror of what had happened in the Americas over the past two centuries, except for the fact that slavery was a standard labor practice used. Like the colonists in the Americas, Hawaiian plantation owners were searching for these individuals in countries of perceived lesser development, importance, and economic stature. Between 1876 and 1900, approximately 45,000 Chinese immigrated to Hawaii. The Chinese also offered valuable knowledge to the planters during the early stages of the industry in Hawaii. Planters had no knowledge of sugar on a commercial basis and thus turned to the Chinese who were more versed in the production of the crop. In spite of this need for expertise and labor, several issues surfaced with the Chinese worker situation. First of which involved the plantation contract, which functioned much like it would have during feudal times. Wages for workers were low and working conditions were less than optimal. Once contracts expired, many of the Chinese would not renew, but instead move to urban areas where they would compete with natives for employment. This also makes the Chinese one of the first major contributors to the beginnings of Hawaii's middle class as they established many businesses and strong community. By the early 1880s, the Chinese constituted one-fourth of the population in the islands. And by the 1884 census in Hawaii, more than half of the male population between the ages of 15 and 50. In the spring of 1882, the U.S. Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act under President Chester A. Arthur. The act provided an absolute 10-year moratorium on the immigration of Chinese labor into America. A side effect of this act included the restricting of Chinese immigration to the islands. In an effort to please its most important trading partner, the U.S., Hawaii passed a law in 1883 to restrict immigration from China. Only 600 individuals within a three-month period would be allowed in for settlement. This effectively halted Chinese immigration and their involvement with Hawaiian plantations. This, along with the annexation of Hawaii by the U.S. in 1898, were also important factors that prevented the Chinese influence on pineapple plantations. The first group with significant impact on pineapple plantations were the Japanese. When the U.S. and subsequently Hawaii passed laws to exclude the Chinese, the importation of Japanese labor had already begun in the islands. The Japanese community that came can be grouped into two distinct categories, the Uchi Nanchu, or Okinawans, and the Naichi, or Mainlanders. These are terms derived from the Okinawan dialect and not terms that would have been used by individuals who immigrated from the islands of Kyushu and Honshu, considered the main islands of Japan. Okinawans spoke in a very distinct dialect because of their distance from the main islands and proximity to China. This, along with perceived differences in customs and physical appearances, created frictions between the groups. In 1885, two years after the Chinese restrictions were in place, Japanese labor increased dramatically. This population grew even more, and between 1898 to 1900, about 38,000 Japanese were admitted as new arrivals. By 1907, the total population of Japanese immigrants was around 44,000, with one-fifth of them having originated from Okinawa. At this time, tensions from the increase of immigrants coming from Asia to America, and in particular, California, pushed the Japanese government to enter into a gentleman's agreement with the U.S. 
in this, Japan agreed not to issue passports for Japanese citizens wishing to work in the continental U.S., thus effectively halting new Japanese immigration and again severely limiting immigration to Hawaii. The United States, in exchange for this halt, agreed to accept the presence of Japanese immigrants already residing in the U.S. and permit those with families the right to send for their wives, children, and parents. The agreement was also to provide legal protection for Japanese American children who were prone to discrimination practices, especially on the West Coast. Later, in 1924, amid rising tensions in Hawaii and the Western United States, the Federal Immigration Act was introduced. This law included a provision excluding from entry any alien who by virtue of race or nationality was ineligible for citizenship. Existing nationality laws already in place prevented people of Asian lineage from naturalizing, and as a result of this act, even Asians not previously prevented from immigrating, the Japanese in particular, would no longer be admitted to the United States. By this time, however, over 200,000 individuals of Japanese descent had immigrated to Hawaii as plantation laborers. Because of growing tensions and this act, a complete moratorium was in place for people coming from Japan and the rest of Asia, excluding the Philippines, which was now also a territory of the United States. The annexation of the Philippines occurred on December 10, 1898, through the Treaty of Paris. This was a godsend to the planters. It meant that as American subjects, Filipinos could be recruited for work on the Hawaiian plantations without any immigration restrictions, and between 1906 and 1930, the HSPA had brought in approximately 120,000 Filipinos to Hawaii. A steady increase in numbers between those years eventually made the Filipino community the largest percentage of any workforce within the plantation system. Other groups also contributed to the cultural flavor of Hawaiian plantations. These included the Portuguese, Puerto Ricans, Koreans, Russians, Spanish, Norwegians, and Germans. The Russians, Norwegians, and Germans had little effect on plantation life and culture, especially as concerned with pineapple. The Portuguese immigrated to Hawaii from 1878 to 1911, and during that period, around 16,000 made the trip from the islands off the shore of Portugal, primarily Madeira and the Azores. Unlike the Chinese and Japanese, who came primarily as single men, the Portuguese came as families. This made them more likely to plant permanent roots once they hit the shores of Hawaii. Although overall receiving more favorable treatment than the Chinese and Japanese, they still faced an uphill battle. The elites, primarily of European descent, thought of the Portuguese as an inferior class regardless of their own European backgrounds. But that background did ensure they were offered superior contracts to immigrant workers from Asia. Many received an acre of land, better working conditions, and job titles, often serving as Luna or supervisors. Later, when Hawaii was annexed to the U.S., they were also granted American citizenship. This came in handy for those who felt mistreated by the powers that be in the islands. Those who stayed have to suffer through some trauma from being treated less favorable than others with European backgrounds. However, the opportunities afforded the Portuguese once their plantation days ended were far greater than a majority of their Asian counterparts. Puerto Ricans, on the other hand, were treated even less favorably than the Portuguese. Puerto Rican immigration began when Puerto Rico's sugar industry was devastated by two hurricanes in 1899. The devastation caused a worldwide shortage in sugar 
and a huge demand for the product from Hawaii. Hawaiian sugarcane plantation owners began to recruit the experienced laborers from Puerto Rico. Once in Hawaii, they experienced discrimination and bigotry in much the same manner as their Asian counterparts. At the turn of the 1900s, Puerto Rico and Hawaii were unincorporated territories of the United States. However, the passage of the Jones-Shafroth Act of 1917, the same year that the United States entered World War I, granted American citizenship to the Puerto Rican resident in Puerto Rico and excluded those who resided in Hawaii, giving them yet another disadvantage in the islands. This did not preclude them from being assigned draft numbers and obligations to military duty if called upon. Where territorial status had been very favorable to the plantation owners, Puerto Ricans suffered even more injustices because of it. Another group that ventured to Hawaii's plantations were the Koreans. The first significant wave of Korean immigration started on January 13, 1903, when a shipload of Korean immigrants arrived in Hawaii to work on pineapple and sugar plantations. By 1905, more than 7,226 Koreans had come to Hawaii. In that number were 637 women and 465 children. They came to escape the famines and turbulent political climate of Korea. Most were from small rural villages in Korea. With Hawaii a U.S. territory by the time of their arrival, the Organic Acts of 1900 played an important role in their plantation experience. The Act banned contract labor, thus it prevented Korean laborers from being locked into long-term contracts. These contracts had slowed previous ethnic groups' assimilation into other fields of work. The Koreans, free from this hindrance, quickly ditched plantation life to live for themselves and seek other opportunities, many of which opened businesses. Spanish immigration to Hawaii began in 1907 when the Hawaiian government and the Hawaiian Sugar Planters Association, HSPA, decided to supplement their ongoing importation of Portuguese workers to Hawaii with workers recruited from Spain. Importation of Spanish laborers, along with their families, continued until 1913, during which more than 9,000 Spanish immigrated to the islands, primarily to work on plantations. The Spanish, in earnest, had been in the islands since at least 1793, when Don Francisco de Palamarin, a Spaniard, became influential in the early kingdom of Hawaii under Kamehameha I. Marin introduced many agricultural first, but is noted most for his 1813 introduction of the first cultivated pineapple crop to Hawaii. His fellow countrymen arrived around 100 years after he first stepped foot on Hawaii, and most were under the impression that life here was much better on the plantation than it actually turned out to be. For this reason and others, most of this wave of Spaniards left the island shortly after fulfilling their contracts, then subsequently moved on to other locations in the U.S., primarily California. By the 1930s, only 1,219 of the initial 9,000 Spaniards remained, making them about 0.3% of the total population. The Russians who arrived were primarily from Siberia. On October 21, 1909, 200 Siberians arrived in Honolulu Harbor. They were brought here after a strike by thousands of Japanese laborers, convinced plantation owners their size and influence on the industry was growing too strong. In one last-ditch effort to decrease Asian influence and increase populations of European descent, the Hawaiian Board of Immigration began the recruitment of Russians. 
a report issued by the board described local planters as, quote, willing without reserve to employ all the Caucasian workers the government can bring to the islands at a wage one-third larger than what was paid Asian laborers. A Russian named A.W. Peralstras, who was a contractor for the Trans-Siberian Railroad, played an important role in this recruitment scheme. He had met a Hawaiian plantation manager named James Lowe in Valdivostok, Russia. Lowe encouraged him to take a vacation to Hawaii, and on his vacation, he had the opportunity to meet with Governor Walter Freer, the brother-in-law of Walter Dillingham, Oahu Railroad's president and an individual whose investment in the plantation system was steadily growing. They agreed on an effort to recruit Siberians in the hope they would provide a counterbalance to the powerful unions of Asian labor. This was similar in thought to earlier attempts made with the Portuguese and Spanish. As a whole, anti-Asian settlement was ever increasing as unions continued to make stronger demands for equal treatment, wages, and working conditions. In order to recruit his countrymen, Peralstras presented false claims of prosperity to be had in Hawaii. Unfortunately for Peralstras, his recruitment was over as quickly as it had started. When he returned to Hawaii with a third wave of immigrants from Siberia, the only greeting he received upon disembarkment came from the previous two waves of disgruntled Russians. The Russians he recruited were experiencing a different paradise than had been promised. On April 1, 1910, this disgruntled group went on strike and made demands similar to their Asian counterparts. This pushed government officials to make a last-ditch effort to appease them. Meeting at Iolani Palace, they were presented with the best terms the planters were willing to offer. The terms were rejected and a riot ensued as the group attacked Peralstra, shouting, We would rather starve and die than work the fields. Reaching an impasse, the Russians were essentially left to fend for themselves. Of the roughly 1,500 who had made the venture, few decided to tough it out in Hawaii. Most ended up back in Russia or on the west coast of the U.S., primarily in California. Those who did stay initially set up camp in the red light district of Ivole, an area near the docks. They built colorful shanty towns and were reduced to taking charity and selling whatever helped in their survival. Eventually, this group assimilated into society, working at the pineapple canneries, sawmills, and stores. A few even returned to the plantation that had initially caused their dissatisfaction. This experiment, essentially done to effect change on the racial demographic of Hawaii, ended up costing the government $143,581, or about $3.7 million today. Democratic rule had no place in plantation-era Hawaii. An oligarchy ruled the politics and economy across the archipelago. Plantation immigrants struggled to carve out a life for themselves in a land controlled almost exclusively by large commercial interests. The early days of pineapple required hands-on labor, literally. If a field needed clearing, Workers used mule teams to remove brush, trees, and stone. Once debris was removed, mules would draw plows through the rich volcanic soil in preparation for planting the crop. Then slips were put into the ground by hand. The process got more labor-intensive at harvest. Workers earned every penny they got from their employers. The workday was long, both on and off the job. 
workers' lives were strictly controlled by the plantation. Each planter hired a private army comprised of individuals mostly of European ancestry, who oversaw a group of individuals primarily of Asian origin. These overseers enforced company rules by any means necessary. Severe fines and harsh punishments were not out of the ordinary. Whippings were not uncommon, and these punishments could be imposed for a number of offenses. Talking, smoking, or pausing in the field to stretch were valid reason to receive the wrath of a luna, the Hawaiian word that translates literally to high or above. On the plantation, it meant boss or supervisor, who was typically on a horse so he could survey the fields above the growing pineapple or cane. An Okinawan immigrant recalled the reaction some had to the possibility of being whipped. Because of the um, perpetual fear of this unbearable whipping, some workers committed suicide by hanging or jumping in front of the oncoming train. Fortunately, we Okinawans have been trained through age to endure hardships caused by terrible typhoons. So no one among us committed suicide. However, there was no one who wasn't whipped. Kinji Chinzen. The thought of being beaten for not performing tasks would be difficult for an individual brought many to a breaking point. Punishments happen daily, and a lack of workers' rights left most unrecorded along with acts of resistance. As workers were technically not enslaved, many resorted to violence as a way of protest. Workers often attempted to protect themselves against the violence doled out by the Lunas. These acts of retaliation often brought on even harsher penalties for the workers involved. Lunas acting on behalf of the plantation owners imposed their will, leaving workers with fundamentally no control over their lives and bodies. Until 1900, plantation workers were legally bound to three to five year contracts and deserters could be jailed, called ha'alelehana or desertion from service was common as many workers found the work and living conditions intolerable. In 1892, authorities arrested 5,706 individuals for deserting their contract services on the plantations. Most of these arrests resulted in convictions. In fact, the chances of being found not guilty was around 3%. The sentence for those convicted was usually a forced return to the plantation. To control the problem of ha'alelehana, planters formed surveillance networks, or an informal system of mutual assistance to find and capture deserters. Others offered rewards for the capture of runaways. These incentives gave individuals more motivation to identify and report suspicious individuals thought to be escaped laborers to the authorities. Most of these workers had farmed for themselves in their home country, and the relentless toil and impersonal scale of industrial agriculture proved unbearable. For the many who stayed, thousands fled to the mainland or their mother countries long before their contracts were up. Those who weathered the storm a sense of union developed as the realization that the plight of many carries a resonance stronger than one. Plantation workers began grouping together as early as 1851 to fight the harsh realities of their condition. None of these protests produced results until 1909. In that year, about 70% of Hawaii's plantation workers went on strike. These were primarily sugar plantation workers, but their efforts brought change across the industry. 
The strike lasted for months, and police harassed and arrested strikers en masse. Many were forcibly removed from their company-provided housing and received 24-hour eviction notices. This, in turn, forced officials in Honolulu to scramble in search of shelter for thousands of displaced individuals. Yasutoru Soga of the Nipujiji wrote, The city of Honolulu was just like a battlefield. With everything in extreme confusion, the displacement and dwindling supplies eventually drove some workers back to the fields. Then on August 5, 1909, organizers officially ended the strike. The workers couldn't claim total victory until later in the year when the minimum wage was raised to $22 a month or $620 in today's money. Although paltry wages, it is what they had demanded and improved the collective quality of life. The strike was also a motivating factor as mentioned in recruitment efforts for people of non-Asian descent. Over the years, even with these gradual improvements, plantation life had remained rigidly segregated by nationality. Japanese, Chinese, and Filipino laborers tending to work and play within their own communities. These distinctions could even be condensed down beyond ethnicity to a regional level. An example of this was with the Okinawan community, who saw themselves as distinctly different from mainland Japanese, with the opposite also being true. Regardless of the segmentation of ethnicities, you could rest assured that every worker had their life's existence strongly tied to the plantation. A contemporary observer described vividly a plantation payday which took place once a month. Outside of the plantation office, where the laborers received their wages, stretches a long line of vehicles, ancient and new, large and small, ranging from a rickety fish wagon to the ultra smart coupe, each is waiting with a common purpose to get a payment on the laborer's bill. The laborers fall in line along the walk leading to the paymaster's office window. Plantation police keep order in the line to stand by the window and check the bangos. A bango is a copper plate with the worker's identification number engraved on it. And the workers use their bango to make purchases at the plantation store on credit and as a time clock during work hours. It was his pass and he has fined a dollar if he loses it. The bango must be checked to be sure each man gets his own pay envelope. The policeman hands the bango to the paymaster who returns it to the laborer with the pay envelope containing his monthly earnings after deduction for plantation store bills. Sometimes it is only a receipt that greets the eyes of the eager employee. His money has been entirely consumed in bills. Sometimes there is a balance of from $2 to $10 or maybe 15 Whatever may be left in the pay envelope is not infrequently consumed by the waiting line of creditors. Roman R. Carriaga. The company store was another gift and burden for workers on plantations. Because of the distance to town and lack of alternatives, workers were dependent on the plantation store for many supplies and goods. With this in mind, a worker would be wise to keep careful track of their spending habits. Those who didn't could easily fall into debt as the company store was more than happy to issue credit. And why not? The store knew where to collect on its debts on the other side of its accounting department, the one that issued payments to the workers. For this reason, falling into debt could be very detrimental to workers. A worker in debt owes time to the plantation. Time spent on the plantation was something many were dying to escape. A worker's burden, but plantation owner's boon. On the plantation, one could say you lived a very insular life. All your peers lived in company housing, much of which was meager and unsanitary like your own. If you were a Luna, your accommodations were considerably better 
but a majority of workers who devoted 10 to 12 hours of work returned exhausted to dismal, termite-ridden bunkhouses. Conditions varied from plantation to plantation, but typically workers huddled together in barracks that accommodated anywhere from 6 to 40 men. Their bed, roughly 1 by 12 wooden planks. If you were married, you fared a little better as you were given a small furnished room to accommodate your family, regardless of size. Privacy was a luxury enjoyed by few, as workers tended to group together according to their racial and ethnic identities, different ways to pass the idle hours emerged. Japanese workers enjoyed community baths and some traditions from their homeland. Buddhist temples sprung up on every plantation and many had their own resident Buddhist priest. The midsummer holiday of Obon, the festival of the souls, was celebrated throughout the plantation system, and all work stopped on November 3rd in celebration of the then Emperor of Japan's birthday, Emperor Meiji. Filipinos on plantations spent their off hours in various ways. They enjoyed playing baseball and other sports, but gambling was the most popular, with cockfights drawing the largest crowds. Card games were popular with all groups. Sakura, which originated in Japan, was probably the most played. Taxi dance halls were also popular. They crowded the taxi dance halls, craving the company of women. Filipino string bands traveling from plantation to plantation played music at dances. Filipino men eagerly purchased tickets that offered them momentary joy. Three minutes to hold, touch, and dance with a woman. Rano Takaki. The sad reality of their lives is that many did not have their wives, girlfriends, or even a woman to spend time with. For a time, Filipino women were so rare on the islands that men were willing to pay up to $50 for three minutes with a woman from back home. For these men of all ethnicities, life could seem empty because of the loneliness. Those who needed comfort beyond their mental capacities could find the same vices you would expect anywhere else in the world. Alcohol, drugs, gambling, and of course, prostitution. And where there is a need, entrepreneurs always find opportunity. As an example, among the 3,726 Japanese women who arrived in Hawaii, there were likely some prostitutes. Men in Hawaii and women from Japan recognized the potential that existed in this gender gap, some legitimately trying to find substantial connections and others just looking for comfort found connections through brokers capitalizing on this imbalance. The reality was, money earned by these mostly young men barely sustained their own subsistence. Regardless of this fact, the need for companionship pushed many to save, spend, or borrow for the opportunity to be in the arms of a woman. For women who made it to the islands, this could be a profitable or unhappy situation. But the first hurdle for women of non-European persuasion was gaining entry into the islands. The difficulty of unmarried women to migrate to Hawaii brought into being a new scheme for getting visas, the picture bride. During this period, picture brides were allowed as a way of summoning families, or yobi yose jidai, and securing passage to Hawaii. These women were entered into their future husband's family registry in Japan, and upon arriving in Hawaii, both knowingly and unwillingly, many became prostitutes rather than wives. Pimps and madams, with promises of a brighter future, either through legitimate marriages or economic opportunity, lured these young, gullible women from their families and hometowns. Many who arrived were forced into the sex trade and shamed into not trying to return home with the threat of telling their family and community about their island lifestyle. 
a report written by the Committee on Social Evil in May 1914 reported that some prostitutes were, quote, brought into the territory as picture brides, as men who desired to exploit them for their own gain, unquote. These type of acts were not confined to any one ethnic group, as schemes and ideas to exploit the lack of women were prevalent. Another pastime all ethnic groups on the plantation enjoyed was talking story to pass the hours. This was done at the boarding houses, community centers, and stores on the plantation. Even though individuals tended to stay in their own ethnic enclaves, they did socialize with each other from time to time, and telling stories was a great way to interact and get to know one another. In having to communicate, both for entertainment and especially work, common phrases and words that could be understood by all, regardless of background, became really important. From this, Hawaiian pidgin developed, a marrying of English with mother tongues from around the world, a mix of Portuguese, Hawaiian, Cantonese, Ilocano, Tagalog, Japanese, Korean, and Scottish were among the languages or dialects that melded to help plantation workers communicate. The combination of pineapple producers and its workers had made the industry a success. People on the mainland began to recognize Hawaii and the pineapple. Since Hawaii was out of reach for most Americans, many decided, why not enjoy a little taste of heaven from a can? Hawaii's pineapple campaign was benefiting the brand and many other sectors of the Hawaiian economy. And as connections between Hawaii and the mainland became stronger, the brand value Hawaii increased across the board. Jamaica had rum, Tahiti had gogan, but Hawaii had pineapple. And pineapple was poised to make quite an impact on the American palate. The pineapple industry sold a dream, and soon grocery stores in major cities were selling out of that dream. Sales in Chicago, San Francisco, and New York rose significantly. Orders poured in, and within less than two years, they were depleting their warehouse supplies. By 1915, pineapple became the second leading industry in revenues behind sugar. From that point on, the industry witnessed exponential growth most years until the 1990s. The idea to form a pineapple cooperative for the study, business, and especially advertising a pineapple helped add intrinsic value to Hawaiian canned pineapple. This in turn helped in retailing the product at a premium price. Eat Hawaiian pineapple because it's the best. No kaoi. Even when canneries in Taiwan came to match the Hawaiian product's qualities in the 1930s, the Hawaiian product still retailed at a higher price because the brand had been established as the best of the best. It's all about the branding. And as the branding and revenue grew, so did the industry's influence over Hawaii. In 1923, James Dole used the wealth and power of his Hawaiian pineapple company to purchase an entire island, Lanai, the sixth largest in the state. Prior to his purchase, the island had been occupied since the 15th century by small groups of inhabitants. In 1854, a group of Mormons were granted a lease of an Ahu Pua'a, which is a Hawaiian way of dividing land from the mountaintops to the sea. The land name Palavai was settled by Hawaiians converted to the Mormon religion. The initial leaders left, but in 1862, Walter M. Gibson 
took over leadership of the group. A year later, Gibson bought the land for $3,000 with money from the church but put the title in his name. When the Mormons found out, they excommunicated Gibson. He decided to keep the land. By the 1870s, Gibson not only owned his original Ahu Pua'a, but acquired most of the rest of Lanai for ranching. He was able to do so by winning the favor of King Kalakaua, who gave his approval and political influence. After the 1887 Bayonet Constitution, most of the influential class saw Gibson as a traitor and wished him locked up or killed. Gibson decided to flee. He left the islands, never to return again. This left the majority of Lanai in the control of his daughter, Tallulah Lucy Hazelden, and his son-in-law. They formed Manalei Sugar Company in 1899, but in less than two years, the company was effectively bankrupt. During this short period of operation, nearly 800 laborers, mostly from Japan, had been contracted for the plantations. Once the plantation system failed, some of these workers moved on to other islands, stayed, or returned to Japan. Between 1902 and 1907, Charles Gay purchased large parts of Lanai. The population at this time was around 619. Gay acquired more of Lanai until he owned everything, minus 100 acres. However, due to financial difficulties, this was short-lived. He was forced to transfer most of the land to W.G. Irwin, who at one time was a member of King Kalakaua's Privy Council. This left Gay with around 600 acres, and in 1921, he attempted to start a pineapple plantation, but it failed. The next year in 1922, Gay's portion, along with what was now owned by the Lanai Company, was bought by James Dole's Hawaiian Pineapple Company for $1.1 million, the equivalent of $17 million today. When the Hawaiian Pineapple Company took over Lanai, it became the center of Hawaii's pineapple industry, and by default, the pineapple capital of the world. This was a fulfillment of sorts for James Dole, who had come to Hawaii with a dream and used his connections and pineapples to achieve heights he probably didn't even imagine. In 1923, development of the pineapple plantation begins on a massive scale. Livestock on Lanai that had grown out of control was reduced, especially cattle. A new water system was started along with dredging of Kamaulau Pau Harbor. Lanai City was planned and constructed along with road building. Lanai was no longer a sleepy little outpost trying to find an identity. Land plowed and tilled was prepared for King Pineapple. The population of Lanai in 1925 was almost non-existent, just 99 people of mostly Hawaiian descent. The following year, Hawaiian pineapple would see its first harvest, and from that point forward, pineapple and the population of Lanai would steadily increase. Unfortunately, this high point in the industry was also the beginning of the demise of James Dole. To purchase Lanai, Dole relinquished a one-third interest of his company to the Waialua Agricultural Company, a sugar producer. This was a company he had been in business with for some time. He leased land for pineapple that they didn't use for sugar. Waialua was for extensive purposes part of Castle and Cook, who owned 20% of the business. Castle and Cook, part of Hawaii's Big Five, a group of companies that virtually controlled the islands, had been in recent disputes with Dole over shipping contracts. At this point, Dole felt keeping all business within the small powerful group hurt his bottom line, but perhaps he forgot the benefits he had reaped from similar relationships in the past. As Dole was expanding his business, he started borrowing heavily. The economy was booming, and so was business, so no problem. For seven years after Lanai came online, his company continued having fabulous success including during the beginning of the Great Depression. 
Dole, believing the company would be unaffected, decided to expand plant operations, which cost $5 million, on top of a $3.5 million he already owed to banks. When his 1931 earnings were made public, his company showed losses, although still profitable. Hawaiian pineapple sold at a premium, but people could barely afford standard fare. On top of that, pineapple was still thought of as an exquisite luxury, not necessarily the fruit you think of when going through hard times. As a result, his warehouses started to fill up as demand slowed. Dole lowered prices, but inventory continued to pile up and creditors began to get anxious. This pressure was increased due to his unwillingness to continue business as usual with the Big Five, and this led to a major miscalculation on his part when he declined to use the major transporter of goods from Hawaii to the mainland, Matson Navigation Company, which was partially owned by Alexander and Baldwin Incorporated, a Big Five company. Instead, early in 1931, he signed a three-year contract with the Ismith Line out of New York. From this point forward, Dole became persona non grata in Hawaiian business and political circles. When he asked for an extension of credit, his request fell on deaf ears. So he turned to banks in San Francisco, another unfortunate choice as this was the home of Matt's in navigation. Not surprisingly, his pleas in the city by the bay also went unheard. With nowhere else to turn, Hawaiian creditors put his company in the bullseye. Their focus perked the interests of companies outside of Hawaii as a takeover target and potential entry into the Hawaiian market. Castle and Cook, who enjoyed the strength and influence as a big five company, did not want outsiders influencing business as usual in the islands. They forced their stake in the company and kicked Dole out of his leadership role. In 1932, Castle and Cook assumed a 21% stake in the Hawaiian Pineapple Company, along with Waialua's now 37%. Castle and Cook effectively had controlling interest. Dole was allowed to remain on as chairman for a time, but his control was completely gone. Dole was sent on a well-earned rest from which he was never recalled. When he tried returning in 1933, he found his office moved to a storeroom and his company now being led by Atherton Richards from Castle and Cook. Dole stayed on as the face of the company years after receiving a retainer of $30,000 a year until 1948 when he was completely forced out. Within four years of Castle and Cook's takeover of Hawaiian Pineapple Company, it returned to profitability and washed away all its debt. Joseph Atherton Richards is the great-grandson of missionaries Amos Star Cook and Juliet Montag. Amos Star Cook and Samuel Northrop Castle are the founders of Castle and Cook. Atherton Richards, during his time as chair, foresaw the potential loss of the U.S. market to foreign competition. These first steps into foreign markets were brought about by a company that entered Hawaii in 1917, CalPAC or California Packing Corporation, now known as Del Monte. CalPAC was looking to start a farm overseas to reduce labor costs. Why import labor when you can go to them? In 1941, Richards pushed for legislation that would ban the export of pineapple planting material that could be used to start plantations in the Philippines or South America. The bill passed the legislature, but was killed by then-Governor Poindexter by veto. Soon after this, World War II started, and the need to worry about the export of production abroad was quelled. Richards would leave Hawaiian pineapple later that year. In spite of these first moves abroad, Hawaiian pineapple and the rest of the industry continue to have a hold for decades to come. There are some key factors that worked in their favor and helped them remain strong. First, Lanai. Think of it, an entire island dedicated to the production of one crop. 
It is not often one company can dictate virtually everything, inside and out of its normal purview of control. Another major advantage was an industry-leading invention, the Ginnaka machine for cutting pineapples. In 1911, James Dole hired Henry G. Ginnaka to design a machine to automate the process of processing pineapple. As fruit dropped through the Ginnaka machine, a cylinder was cut to proper diameter, trimmed on top and bottom, then cored. This machine more than tripled production, which quickly helped push the industry. Ginnaka designed the machine during his first year at Hapco and continued to improve on that design until 1914. He returned to the mainland with his brothers to try his hand at mining. Unfortunately, Henry died only seven years after his invention, an invention for which he received no patent rights and only 50% of profits from sales. Sales that never amounted to much because of fears of mass dissemination of the machine could threaten the dominance of the company. This was probably a legitimate concern because of its innovative design. The Ginnaka machine was so successful, it won a gold medal at the Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco in 1950. Another great asset to Hawaiian pineapple was the cooperative that was formed to market the fruit. In time, a research arm was added to maintain the quality and standard people had grown to expect. The AHPC, or Association of Hawaiian Pineapple Companies, was superseded in 1933 by the Pineapple Producers Cooperative Association, or the PPCA. The PPCA was replaced by the Pineapple Growers Association of Hawaii in 1944, and that organization survived until early in the 21st century. A final key factor that played into the longevity of the industry was the introduction of pineapple juice on the national scale. This started in the early 1930s. Once the industry recovered from the Great Depression, those in charge at Hawaiian Pineapple decided to introduce the juice on the market. James Dole had played a prominent role in the development of juice, but never got the opportunity to introduce it. When it was finally promoted and launched, it became a huge success, from 6,000 cases in 1933 to a whopping 700,000 the following year. By 1936, that number had grown to 7.5 million cases. The production of juice had another benefit to growers as an outlet for overproduction of the fruit. This growth and strength in the market overall kept the industry strong well into the 1960s. During the 1960s and until the 2000s, the gradual decline of the industry started. Shipments of fresh pineapple dropped off after 1996 when exports from South America produced essentially the same product. These pineapples were grown by the same companies that dominated the Hawaiian market, but with cheaper labor and shipping costs. Essentially, Hawaiian companies squeezed Hawaii out of the market by making it commercially too expensive. Finally, in 2007, Maui Land and Pineapple Company, who ran the last existing cannery, closed its production line, and effectively ended the era of pineapple's dominance in the islands. The circumstances that brought about the fall of the Hawaii industry are no different from those that helped its rise. Globalization allowed companies to move to new locations with cheap labor and favorable laws. The only difference now is the ease with which this process can happen. Pineapple an industry that dominated the U.S., first with fresh product, then cans, and finally juice, reinvented itself multiple times to maintain and expand its hold on the industry, first in the U.S. and finally worldwide. For over 100 years, the center of pineapple production was Hawaii, and its influence on the culture, politics, and economics of the islands are apparent now. Today in Hawaii, 
production still exists, but mainly to feed a local demand, which includes tourism. And tourists still associate the pineapple with Hawaii. If you look around, beyond the last fields remaining, you will see all that pineapple has done for Hawaii. It's in the bars, the lobbies, the art, and the culture. Most importantly, it's in the people whose parents and grandparents work the plantations and now call Hawaii their home.